Welcome back to the show. Now, last week, uh, we talked a lot about the miracles that made up my life. And as you know, I have told millions of stories, but I've never told mine until now with this show. So this week, I have the pleasure of talking about another aspect of making your story a bestseller, a bestseller with the days of your life, and that's laughter. And to share this conversation with me, I have Shaleen Bryan. Now, Shaleen is an incredible author herself. She's a New York Times bestselling author. She tours and speaks all over the country. People are gripped. As soon as she gets on the stage, they are listening to everything she says. Now, she is uh, hilarious, so I'll say that for sure. She's one of my very best friends. Like We talk all the time, and we share the deepest places of our hearts, but she also can make you cry. She's that person who can take your emotions and um, and just draw you closer to God in a moment. She's so talented, so gifted. She's I can say one of my best friends, and I welcome you now to the show, Shaleen. Thank you for joining me. Woo! I'm so excited to be here. Well, I tell you, um, you know, and I, and I look back at our life and just like how it all began, and only God could have put our our stories together. So, uh, do you remember how that was? We were on a cruise 100%. ship. Hundred percent. So I'm not a cruise ship girl. You know what I mean? Because a floating buffet of food is not my friend. <laughs> You know what I mean? There's some people that run the deck and exercise. I get the soft serve at one in the morning. You know what I mean? So when my dear, my dear, dear friend, Candace, who some of you know, probably from Full House, Candace Cameron Bure, um, she is the godmother to my kids. She was going to go speak on this cruise with all these famous people. And she says, please come. And I'm like, can, I really don't want to do a cruise because it's just a floating buffet for me. I just, I leave, I, I show up heavy and I leave heavier. <laughs> hey guys, this is Ryan Grow from Lifeway Films. And I just wanted to let you know, I recently had the opportunity to see Someone Like You, which is a movie by Karen Kingsbury. And I tell you what, I loved it. It was an incredible film that really provides a framework for forgiveness and working through hard times. You're going to walk out of the theater feeling good and encouraged in your faith. So I would just encourage you, go to someonelikeyou.movie, see the trailer, sign up for Karen's A-list, and also you can purchase tickets and learn more about the movie. That's someonelikeyou.movie. Don't miss it. So she goes, please come. It's going to be a really great time. And so I went. I went. It was my first cruise I'd ever been on. Um, and... She says, I have a book signing on Saturday. So when we get there, we'll get in the rooms and then we need to go to the book signing. Now, I've known Candace since she was like 14 years old when Full House was in its heyday before Fuller House even existed. And the lines to sign for her have always been crazy. And I'm like, okay, you know, we'll go. I'm going to sit with her. I'm going to support her. I love her. And we start to walk and we see the line. And I love people. Um... Yet this line was a little bit, a little bit crazy. It was literally wrapping around this cruise ship, okay, through the Lido deck, up the stairs, back around, and it's, and I go, can I go, buddy? This is gonna, this is gonna be a long time. And she's like, I know, I know, but let's go, let's get to the front. Because so I go to the front of the line, I realize, thank you, Jesus, this line wasn't for Candace. It was for you, Karen. And these women are holding like 75 books on both arms, two children. They had one clutch between their leg. I think they were balancing a couple on their head of all your number one New York Times bestsellers, by the way. And I'm going, who is this person? I never, your picture was, I'd never seen, I've never met you. I've never read your book. And as we get to the front of the line, I see what you have a book called now a series angel an angel walking the way you connect with your readers no wonder you have 25 million books in print or more these people got to have a hula hoop moment with you in your hula hoop space like no one else existed that I almost read a book and got in line you know what I mean? I just wanted to meet you. Just watching you <laughs> love people so well. You just Aww. splash Jesus wherever you go. And I was so intrigued that as Candace was signing, I'm watching these women and how your stories completely changed their life. They completely changed their trajectory on their goals and dreams and the way they speak to people. And I'm eavesdropping in on this for about a couple hours till Candace is done. And then she goes, okay, we're gonna go to dinner. And I'm like, I think I need to bring that author some food. 
Like she's been here for hours and you stayed. We went to dinner. I don't even know if I ever told you this. We went to dinner. And when we came back from dinner, you still were there. You stood there and I got to meet you and uh, Candace obviously got to meet you too. And we came over as you were done with your line and um, we said, can we take you to dinner? It, it had to be after midnight. You go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go. We went and sat down and I said, that's crazy. Like they need to give you a time limit. These people are going a little nuts with you standing here, you know, without a lifeboat. You know what I mean? And you said, no, actually, if someone <laughs> wants to wait, a reader wants to wait in that line, because you're right, that's a crazy line. I will not mm. leave. And I, and you know what? I can mm. say over 15 years later, that was like, what, 18 years ago? You still do that. It chokes me up. Yeah. In a way. You still do that because mm. a lot of people don't. Mm. They drink their Kool-Aid. They think more highly of themselves than they ought to. And so to now be able to promote a movie that Karen Kingsbury Productions put out, the author who wrote all this life-changing <laughs> fiction, right? The author, the very first movie, sitting and watching this film, Someone Like You, is for someone like you watching this right now, listening to this podcast right now. She wrote this, she produced it, She was her fingerprints are in all of it. <laughs> you will leave a better version of yourself. So I can't believe that I get to be at the opening of this movie, I mean, I've sold thousands of tickets. Friends are like, I'm going to this one because none of her story is going to be cut out. We know this, Karen, right? We've produced movies together on some of your other projects. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when Hollywood gets involved and different people's opinions and creative eyes, they like to um, leave beautiful scenes of a movie sometimes on what we call the editing room floor. And I know sometimes even when I've been there That's producing right. something, we shot the shot for you we readers. We got the shot you wanted, but when it got into the editing room, it got destroyed. And so for you to, in your love for your readers and in the love for the creativity that God's given you for these stories to produce and watch over every, from casting. I got to be a small part of the casting, which was unbelievable. The actors in here are crazy. <laughs> You're gonna fall in love with every one of them. And the story that people have fallen in love with, with your books, like that line that day on the cruise, these women are gonna get to bring all their mm -hmm. friends and family to the theaters and actually not have to cover their eyes leave feeling yucky because of a nude scene, but to actually lean in and leave a better version of yourself. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Not only for my family, but for all the families mm. in the world that can actually go to a movie. Cause I love going to the movies. I just don't like to go there and feel like I have to take a shower after, you know? So thank you. I'm so excited to be able to first share of all, this. You're, first of all, you're hilarious. <laughs> That's just the truth. I'm Shane, not even being you're so yet. sweet. It brings tears to my eyes. No, you're, you're so, I'm so proud it's of just, you. I'm just proud oh, of I you. Look, uh, I look back and I go, okay, you and I, I mean, we had a friendship from the very beginning. It was like we people, people rec they think we're sisters, right? They Everywhere do. we go, they're like, it. oh, that's your sister. <laughs> and I they'll say, you, wait, wrong. are you Karen? Or? You kids call me Aunt Shaleen. So you got Austin, you got Tyler, Kelsey, Aunt Shaleen. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, that's Karen's sister. I go, yes, I am. <laughs> that's right. You're just another one of the sisters. That's for sure. Um, but, you know, you and I became such quick friends so fast and sharing our, our love for family, our love for God and creating. And obviously before you were a, a best-selling author and a, you know, nationally renowned speaker, you were in film and you were a producer and you were, uh, you worked with casting first and then producing and, and worked with, you know, Dandelion Dust. We went through that journey together. And so when it, you were one of the first people who said, you've got to do this yourself, Karen, you've got to do it. And it just seemed so overwhelming, like a mountain in front of me, but you were encouraging me to do it. Um, and now to think, you know, when it came time to like putting people in seats, like, how am I going to tell people about this movie, someone like you, and you helped me brainstorm these different ideas and people who could come alongside and help, you know, Candace, uh, she's, um, on the podcast here too. And, uh, Taylor Lautner and Tay, his wife, who are going to be on next week. And just, you helped connect all those dots. You were just like, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And thank you for that. Well, it was so easy to, um, after seeing the film, because I feel like sometimes um, people like to put 
a label on the films that we're making because we love Jesus. So they say, oh, Shaleen, you cast for, for Christian films or you, you produce Christian movies. Mm. That would be like me. There's no such thing, by the way. Okay, just by the way, there's no such thing. I happen to have been a producer no. who loved Jesus, right? <laughs> and so when, um, it'd be like if I was a brain surgeon and it's like, oh, you're a Christian brain surgeon. No, I'm just a brain surgeon who happens to love Jesus. But it's funny how in this industry, because Hollywood really can't figure out why a movie like Sound of Freedom does hundreds of millions of dollars, and yet you and I understand it. And so we see that with your readers, Karen, right? I mean, people can't get your next book. I remember, do you remember the story? Um, I'm gonna share some behind the scenes with all of you, with my bestie here. We were at a Starbucks <laughs> out in Studio City. We were waiting for a, uh, a meeting over there at Disney. And so we went to Starbucks, and Trisha, your sister calls, who's you know the best assistant on the planet, and a producer uh, on this film, she says, Karen, one of your readers, her mom has less than a week to live and she needs to know what happens to this character in this book because you're not gonna have it out till the end of the year. And, and, and I'm like, that's pretty bold. I mean, like you have 25 million books in print, right? And, and you said, Trish, give me her number, I'll call her now. And I'm like, oh, I'm watching this. This is before we even had like a cell phone. You know what I mean? And you call this woman up and this woman, she's in tears. She puts her mom on speakerphone and you tell her exactly what's going to happen to that character. And the mom's crying. The sister's crying. I'm crying. The barista at Starbucks is crying. She's like, can I get that book? And, and you tell her the end of the story. And the daughter said, I don't know. I don't know a way to thank you for that. But it's, I feel like you're such a good steward of the gift that God's given you. And it's so important because everyone listening and watching this today, um, and going to this movie has a gift that God gave just for someone like you. And we can bury it because we're scared we're going to ruin it or not use it right. We can maybe multiply it a little or we can become Karen Kingsbury and just go cast out a wide net. You are not afraid of getting uncomfortable. And I feel like as followers of Jesus, when we get comfortable with God making us uncomfortable, we can make movies like you just made. People are going to thank me um, mm. for, I am not, I couldn't gas this up enough, you guys. I've not only have I seen the movie multiple times, but the cinematography, the directing, the writing, obviously, the acting, it's just, it's one of those films that I can't wait to, as you turn all of your books, um, like they were number one bestsellers into Academy Award winning films. And you're just steps away in the name of Jesus of that. And I am so grateful to have my popcorn in my front row seat uh, because it's going to be life changing for people. I love you, Celine. You're I just too you. much. I, I just, um, you bring tears to my eyes. I, I would have forgotten that story. Yeah, so that thank story. you for sharing it. And um, uh, yes, oh my goodness. And there, I, I mean, I can't, there was another one like that but where the woman wasn't a christian and she was dying oh and got on the phone with me and i got to lead her to jesus like that was like I, of course like yes give me a phone i'm happy to do it like my dad would always say and i'm so happy to know that you're my best friend who knows my dad yeah. even though he's been in heaven for 15 years you got to know him but my dad would say there's no autograph lines in heaven he had his own little seat in the island there in the yes, kitchen right and watching him watch um, your kids in their, in their CYT performances when you guys were living in um, Washington State. And he would just, he had his seat and he would never miss uh, a performance and just <laughs> such a gift that I know him. Yeah. And he knew autograph lines, um, autograph lines were, uh, were not a real thing. There would be no autograph lines in heaven. And so you're just making friends. He said, I, I think you shouldn't think of your readers as fans. You should think of them as friends because if they've gotten to see that much of your heart, then they already know you. And uh, it became a thing. I would like tell everyone that worked on the team, like, let's just not use the word fan, even though I, it's fine. Like, I get it. Today, I can use that word in a different way, you know, in a technical way, I guess, in a sense of talking about people who are drawn to 
what they see of Jesus in me. That's really what it is. But, but I think of them as friends. It really is. It's a reader friend, you know, it's kind of the thing. And now it'll be a film friend that I have. That's right. That's right. But what did you think of Beth? How important was the role of Beth in the movie? How, how important was the role of Beth? I think what's so fascinating. About yeah, sorry, Beth, Beth, by the way, yeah. Beth was the zoo worker in the movie. So how important did you think the role of Beth was? Well, for me, because I love comedy, I think it's always important to have something in there that just, she was just so memorable, right? <laughs> you leave that movie and she made that role her own, um, but her timing, her comedic edge, I, I mean, I love her character. I mean, we're talking about it on your podcast, you know what I mean? And it wasn't one of the major roles, but it was <laughs> one of those unforgettable roles in the movie. And that's what I like about it is it's like, I feel like I, I know, and I don't know if it's because the movie is coming out, um, so many people that are battling um, and trying to have children and they have all these options now in 2023 and 2024 where you can get you know in vitro you could uh adopt you could tr try again you can ivf there's all these options out there and so for you to so creatively write this story um there's a lot of truth to it that's happening in the world today I mean, we have friends in our life. Yeah, it's really true. The embryo adoption. Yeah. Uh, we have friends in our life group who um, they've gone through everything. Their kids, they're funding it all. Um, they're ch in my life group. They're not, I want to be sure I said I'm 55. They're children. They're having a hard time. And I, I just love that you address those topics. You know what I love about your books also? Um, especially like in the Baxter series and the other, I know all this is coming to life, but there's consequences. You don't just always put this bow on it. That's going to be, it's true. It's like there's consequences um, uh, for, for the things that we do. And, and just like there's consequences in our life now, when, when we sin and I live outside of the will of God, um, yes, is he, is, is he grieving that? Sure. But will there be consequences? Yeah, there will be Shaleen. And so I love that you write, so truthfully, you know, it's just beautiful. Mm. Well, I think for, thank you. First of all, that is, um, and, and I think, you know, it's true. People would, people don't want to read something that's full of frosting. They want to be able to read something they can connect to. And in, uh, in someone like you, you have the story of a, of a wonderful family, but parents who took an embryo. So they did embryo adoption, implanted the embryo in the mom and had this baby and by everyone else's view, it looked like it was their baby biologically, but it wasn't. And they knew it, and they just kept thinking of when would be the right time to tell their daughter that she wasn't biologically related to them, and they never found that time. So uh, now she's 24 in the movie, and she has no idea she was adopted as an embryo. In fact, you know, embryo adoption was something I didn't even know existed going into making, writing the book, someone like you. It was why I had to write a book about it, because it was like right. so foreign Fantastic. to me. Yes. Um, but such a beautiful picture. Yeah, such a beautiful picture of, of rescuing, you know, you picture that story of the starfish on the beach, you know, and the little boy after the storm walking along and, and taking up one at a time and throwing it back in the ocean. And the old man comes along and he says, you know, boy, what are you doing? You're not making a difference. There's way too many starfish on the beach. Well, you know, he picks up another one and he throws it back in the water. He says, it matters to this one. Mm -hmm. And and that's the situation with embryo adoption. Five hundred thousand embryos are on ice right now, wow. awaiting adoption, and and that's just a, a concept we can't even fathom. But now our One Chance Foundation that we have that gives adoption grants actually does do grants for people adopting an embryo as well. And on my website there are you know at KarenKingsbury dot com we have at the foundation link pictures of that first embryo baby born to one of our uh, uh, grant wow. uh, recipients. So oh. that it's so wild. It's so and beautiful. Well, no, and I feel like feels. no matter what we can, there's a lot of, yeah, like ethical questions about all of it. Sure. But these babies are there and they're on ice and they're four cells old and waiting for someone to adopt them. So that's a real, a real thing. And, and, um, you know, then you do have to tell the child. So that's like you said, the sin and the consequences that come from that are really what happens when this, with this whole story with someone like you and Andy leaving home. So the fact that we had Beth in there, the zoo worker who could bring some comic relief was incredible. And, you know, for, 
for me, for my story, I often will tell this on stage. You and I have spoken at events together about SeaWorld yes. and about how we went and we were crazy. We were so busy. And we were, when I had this giant backpack on my back with all the supplies because I'm an oldest and I had to be prepared. And then we get to the sea lion show and it's late. The sea lions are already on the stage. There's one row open and I say, there we go. You know, and I, I lunge down the stairs and they're super steep. And I found out later because, you know, one full size step, one half step. One full size step, one half step. Didn't notice that at the time and uh, missed the second step entirely. Tumbled all the way down the stairs. People thought I was part of the show. <laughs> you know, cameras are swinging my way. And uh, I finally stopped tumbling. And, and my backpack now I realize is open. And that's how come they said, oh, she's not part of the show. <laughs> Things are falling out of her backpack. And so I, I, I stopped tumbling. I'm right at my row, right? I stand up. I. I brush myself off, wave off the crowd, turn around, look at Donald, who's like white as a sheet. Like, what is that? <laughs> what just happened to my wife? And, you know, he sends the kids down and I, I kind of like wave him down like, come on, we're, this is our row. And so, um, you know, we sit down, don't remember a thing about the show. And um, afterwards, Donald says to me, uh, he kind of, he'd been just looking at sea lions, like to his credit, like just eyes on the sea lions, the whole show, never looked at me. Um because I think he probably would have burst into laughter. But, you know, right. so after the show, when it was over, after people are walking out, waving at me, you know, kind of pointing at me and waving, then I look at Donald and I say, so how, uh, how did that look? <laughs> and he just kind of like, now that I've given him permission, he starts yeah. to laugh and you know, Donald, and like, he gets that high wheezy sound. Like he's, he was laughing, saw so tears falling down his face. He slithers to the sticky ground. He's like, carrot. <laughs> Karen, you, you look like a sea turtle. This is the backpack. I just, you know, and I'm like, I mean, we both just sat there and laughed so hard. We said, you know, we're going to laugh about it later. Why not That's just right. laugh about it now? Like, I was fine. Like, it's okay. What's that story for you? You know, I feel like God's always giving you material. You know what I mean? <laughs> for your books. It's just like, sing. Always. Happen. Things happen. Um, you know, I have so many different stories. Um, sometimes based on things that I was maybe afraid of um, in my life. Um, and I feel like God's constantly telling me, I want you to fear not, Shalene. I want you to do things. Um, I know the Omega story, but my biggest fear before I went to Africa was because I was raised in a home by a man who was a sniper on the SWAT team. My dad was a very much of a safety man. He wasn't a godly man. Uh, we went to church every Sunday, and we sat in our same seats. My parents were very popular at church, um, but then we'd get in the car, and um, he would always say, "You know, if you're if you're hanging out with the wrong people, I mean, this is a guy. This is a, this is the father that would set the fire alarm off at two in the morning. I'd get my baby sister out of the second floor, throw her into the swimming pool, jump in after her, and go stand on the mark. And he's like, "Listen, if there's a fire, this is what you do, girls." And I'm like, "Can we go back to bed?" Like he wanted us safe and yet we were going to hell and he didn't even wow. realize it. Right. So, um, I had this big fear that I could be falsely accused and go to prison. Okay. So I had this big fear about this. And so I thought I'm going to go speak <laughs> my book. When my book love skip jump came out, I'm going to go speak at a, at a women's prison. So my friend Bianca Oltoff, which I know, you know, Bianca, she, um, she has this prison ministry and she lives out here in California with me in Orange County. And she goes, Hey, why don't you meet me in Corona, California? I'll send you the paperwork. Um, I'm going to get your books in there and we'll go speak at the little chapel. I'm thinking, great. So Karen, the paperwork comes. And I said to my husband, Bryce, who, when we got married, we've been married 33 years. Um, you know that, but he, my husband was a youth pastor. He had a cute butt and loved Jesus. I was all in, got married at 21. And then he became a lawyer. He became a lawyer because that's what you do when you're a youth pastor. Um, and we just serve and, and give to the church now. But my point in this is that I said, read the paperwork, Bryce. And he goes, honey, I don't, I don't need to read it. I know what it says. You're basically signing your life away. If something happens when you're inside the prison, no one's coming to get you. I said, well, you're coming to get me. I said, and you're fine with me signing this. And he goes, honey, if you feel the Lord <laughs> wants you to go speak in there, go, you need to do it. God's with you. I'm like, okay, Bryce. So I sign the paperwork. I send it. I'm really nervous, Karen. I'm, I'm actually very scared. Um, and it's weird because I, you know, I fly to Africa. I go all over the world, but this thing was in my head as a little girl, 
you could go to prison, Shalene. So mm. I start to drive to Corona, California. The morning's there. And I get this phone call from uh, uh, Bianca. She goes, abort. I go, abort. She goes, yeah, there was a prison riot this morning. The whole place is locked down. I go, what? She, I go, B, if we had been there 30 minutes earlier, we would have been in the middle of the prison riot. She goes, yeah, but we weren't, so we'll go next week. I hang up the phone. I'm like, she's crazy. I'm not going next week. What am I, a cat? Yeah. I got nine lives. I mean, I'm not going next week. I think the Lord just wanted to see if I was willing to go. You know what I mean? So sure enough, I go home. My husband's like, well, I'm home early. There was a prison riot. I said, I think, you know, like Isaac, I was, I was willing to go. So God knows my heart. I was obeying. Sure enough, a week goes by. Bianca goes, okay, we're on for Thursday. See you there. Leaves me a message. And I'm like, oh. Oh, wow. So Thursday comes, I drive to Corona. I show up, no prison riot. As I walk in to give my paperwork, my ID, you know, they strip search you basically. This woman, guard, looks at me and she goes, what are you wearing? And, I, and I'm like, wow. Like, she's like, did you not read the paperwork? And, and I'm like, well, I signed it. I, I signed the paperwork. She goes, you can't be in black. The prisoners are in black. I go, I thought orange was the new black. Like, I thought... So she goes, no, they're in dark blue and black, just like your jeans and your black shirt. So I run to Target, Karen. I get a hot pink t-shirt, which you know looked really nice on me, you know. <laughs> and I put this hot pink t-shirt on and go back to the yeah. prison. And the woman goes, okay, pink shirt, follow me. She buzzes you in like you're in Willy Wonka. Bzz, you walk in, it closes behind you. Bzz, you walk in, it locks behind you. And then she, the doors open and it's this huge prison yard. And she goes, your chapel is in the back corner, like four football fields away. I'm like, okay. And I'm there with Bianca and two other women. And I go, well, where's my guard? She goes, what guard? I go, the guard is going to take me to four football fields. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like these women look like they could eat me and I'm not little. You know what I mean? And so she goes, <laughs> Shaleen, she goes, pink shirt. There's two sniper towers up there. You got to walk to the back. I go, well, I didn't meet the men in the sniper towers. Do they know me? Do they know I'm walking to the back? She goes, they see your pink shirt, ma'am. They see it. I'm like, okay. So as I'm walking to the back with, with, Oh Bianca, and I get nervous, you know this about me because you're one of my closest friends. I tell jokes. So as I get nervous, these women in the prison start to walk yeah. towards me. <clears throat> this is when I this is when I meet Rapunzel. This woman starts walking to me with her girlfriends in prison, and she's like, Hey ladies, where are you going? I go, Hi. I said, We're gonna do a little chapel in the back. Why don't you join us? <laughs> she goes, Oh, I can't. I'm gonna go get my hair braided. <laughs> And I'm thinking, I didn't know there was a super cuts in here, right? And I said, right. I said, well, I'll braid your hair. Bianca grabs my hand. She's like, shut <laughs> up. Just walk to the back. So luckily the lady in the prison laughed. Don't, stop talking. <laughs> yeah, stop talking. Just get to the back. We get to the back. And Karen, I, I've told you this, but I saw something I've never seen in my life. And we speak all over the world, right? At women's events, at conferences, at, at, at companies. These women at this little chapel, about a hundred so women, were literally being strip searched to go in to hear about Jesus. There was no gift bag. There was no microphones. There was no music. There was no special food for them to eat. There was no um, book signing. I literally walked into this place and everyone in there had one common goal, to encounter an experience with Jesus. I got to share stories in there that I've never been able to share because my parents are still alive and I want to honor them, you know, but because there were no cameras, no phones, no mics, no nothing, we could just really be real. And as I was done sharing my testimony with these women, um, my new guard friend, pink shirt lady brings me my box of books. And as I opened the box of books to take out love, skip, jump to hand them to the ladies, this woman on my right goes, Oh, I've read that book. And I look at her like, you're so, you're such a liar. Like, I know there's not a Barnes and Noble in here, right? I go, oh, really? I go, what's your name? She goes, Laura. I go, well, Laura, how did you get this book? Because I'm thinking, this is a fresh box. This book just came out a month ago. She goes, 
oh, it's in our prison yeah. library. And I'm thinking, oh, she's a quick liar. Like, that's pretty quick. This is all going in my head. And I said, well, Laura, I want to meet you. And she goes, because I said, I want to meet you because I wrote that book. And she goes, shut the F up. But she says it, we're in prison, right? She goes, you went to Africa to see if yes. Omega was real? And, and, and I realized she'd read my book, Karen. And so I go over and I go, Laura, what are you in here for? Wow. And she goes, well, I beat up my CPS worker, Child Protective Services. They were coming to get my daughter. I'm serving eight years. And it was the best thing that happened to me. And I go, why? She goes, because I didn't know Jesus before I was in here. And I've got four more years to go. And um, I have a question for you. I go, okay. And I'm realizing I'm here today for such a time as now to mm -hmm. meet this woman. I said, what do you need? She goes, I was wondering, you know how you rescued that little girl, Omega? And she was on your refrigerator and you paid her 38 bucks a month and you, and you kept her alive, fed, and in school. I go, yeah. She goes, do you think I could rescue a child? Can I sponsor a kid? And I go, are you are you kidding me? A convicted felon who's serving her eight years in Corona State Penitentiary wants to rescue a child through Compassion International. What is our problem? I said, listen, I said, Laura, I don't know if Compassion lets convicted felons sponsor kids, but I'll do this for you. I'm going to sponsor a kid in your name. And when you get out, you have my book. You see my name, Google me. You'll be able to find me and I will transfer that child to you. She goes, you will? And as I'm hugging her, I get a tap on my shoulder, Karen, and this girl goes, where's my book? Are you gonna braid my hair? It was Rapunzel. Rapunzel ended up showing up. <laughs> and I thought, the power of an invitation, right? The power of an invitation. Uh, and my dear friend, Karen, absolutely. your readers know this about you. This is what you do for them every day with the stories you write with the days of your life. You give people an opportunity, an invitation mm -hmm. to join you in this journey and find the only thing they need to get right. And that's the love of their savior, Jesus Christ. We all just suck and need a savior, right? But Amen. God's gifted you with storytelling in such a way that it allows people to hold a mirror up to their own face. And that's exactly what this movie is going to do for millions and millions of people. So thank you for you and J Mm. You and Donald's generosity, you know, a lot of people wait to get money from Hollywood and then Hollywood kind of controls the way you spend it. And you and Donald just said, you know what? We're just going to fund this whole thing ourselves and we're going to bless it, leave the message to honor God and be true, have the quality, excellent, the editing, the movie, the film, the music, the cinematography, the directing, the producing, and... Now all of you watching this podcast today are going to get an opportunity to lean in and see not only life-changing, best-selling mm -hmm. author, but the next best-selling movie maker, because this is your new lane. I, I mean, you have so many books, we're going to be, you know, producing movies forever. <laughs> I mean, it's unbelievable. Amen to that. And in just two weeks, it's going to be in theaters, which is incredible. But before, before you go, before we end today, I... I really, really want to hear a little more about the Omega story. That was on my list of things that we had to talk about, and you've touched on it. But just, you know, the 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 quick version for sure. But um, I would love to hear, and I want, I want, I've heard the story obviously, but I would love for everyone listening, if you haven't heard this story, that Shalene, uh, it just started to find. A, a different time in your life. Like you obviously love Jesus coming into this situation. In my mind, this is a movie, but yeah, I want to hear it. Karen, you know, I'll let you make this into a movie now. Um, 20 years ago, <laughs> like a little over 20 years ago in 2003, our kids were so little. And so I wanted my, my son Blake and our daughter Brooke to realize how blessed they are living in America. So I did what most people do. I, I sponsored a child. I rescued a kid, $38 a month. I put the pictures on the refrigerator and I would let, I got a little girl for our daughter Brooke who was born in 1999 and same year as my daughter and a little boy for our son Blake born in 1996. Never thought anything of it. We'd send the money. I know Brooke would write letters sometimes and I'd mail them to the address they said to mail it to. But one night I'm having a party here at my house and a girlfriend of mine brought a woman I never met which is fine I'm Italian I love people but this woman points at my refrigerator of the two little children in Africa and she goes you fell for that how do you know those kids aren't 40 years old and they're just taking your money 
And I'm thinking, I'm sorry, lady, what's your name? Can you get out of my house? No. Um, really, I said, I guess I'm just having faith, <laughs> negative lady. I'm just having faith that the money's getting there. She said, well, I never really fall for that. <laughs> so that night I go to bed and I go, Bryce, I'm going to Africa. I want to see where our 38 bucks a month's going. He's like, cool, let's spend $3,000, right? I said, I'm serious. What if it's fake and we're telling little Blake and Brooke we're sponsoring these kids? I could be paying for some guy's Porsche. He goes, honey, you don't even have a passport. Like your big adventure is the Four Seasons. You need to settle down. I go, no, honey, you're going with me. We're telling no one we're coming. I'm going to be Diane Sawyer. I'm going to bust this thing open if it's fake, right? So the night before our trip, I get all the shots. I get my passport. My parents come down to watch our two little kids. The night before our trip, my husband gets very sick. And you know, Bryce is never sick. He's healthy. And I think it's a sign. No. We're going to die in the plane and leave our two kids orphaned while I go try to find these kids that are 40 in Africa. And Bryce goes, honey, you need to go. I think God wants to take a vacation with you. And I'm thinking, no, I think God wants you to suck it up, buttercup, and make it to Heathrow. You know what I mean? But I woke up the next morning, and Bryce was so, he was so calm about it, Karen, that I ripped the pictures off the refrigerator, and I flew from LAX to Heathrow, from Heathrow to Entebbe, East Africa, in coach. So I was a little cranky. I show up in this little village called Gaba in East Africa. And I'm like, hi, I'm from America. I came to meet my two children, AR212 and GR479. Where are they? And this gracious woman goes, follow me. I'm thinking, great, let's get some action done. Two miles later, she literally hikes me into the back lot of a movie set. It was mud huts, the size of my walk-in closet with a bad looking sheet for a front door. And she goes, this is Omega's house. And that's my little girl on my refrigerator. She goes, go in. And as I pull the sheet back to go inside, this little girl darts at me. She goes, Mazungu, which means white, okay? But at the time, I'm thinking she's saying, like, Angel, this white girl just dropped from the sky. I didn't recognize her, Karen. She had grown from her photo. I go, Omega, I'm Shaleen. She goes, I know. And as I was holding her like I would my daughter, Brooke, I'm thinking she's real, like 38 bucks a month. And then my eye catches the Christmas card photo of our family embedded in her mud wall. And I'm thinking she's been getting my mail. I'm like, I'll get you anything because I have an American Express card. I was just sobbing. I go, I'll get you anything, honey. Put my picture up. She gets this big smile on her face. She goes, I'd love a bed. And I'm like, cool. Where's Target Jungle out here? Do you got a Walmart? What do you got? And so I had this opportunity, this sweet little opportunity to take Al Onis, we call him Al, our little boy, and Omega, into Kampala, the capital of their country. And I bought him beds, sheets, a mosquito net for the malaria, a blanket, and a pair of shoes for $20. And I'm like, we're all Oprah over here. I went back and did an HGTV design on a dime. I'm That's like, right. you get a bed, you get a bed, you get a bed. I passed out beds. I rolled out linoleum. I hung mosquito nets. Chip and Joanna Gaines would be so proud of me. I'm doing a design on a dime, you know? And I'm thinking if my girlfriend's <laughs> back home in Los Angeles, if they knew I was skipping a manicure pedicure and keeping these kids alive, fed in school and learning about Jesus, they'd skip it. So when I got back, as you know, I started an organization called skip1.org. It's the number one. Skip one thing once in your life for the sake of someone else. Skip a latte, a lunch, a pack of gum. And we're 14 years old now. Omega is now 24, the same age as my daughter. And this January, I got to surprise her. Uh, and show up at one of the kitchens that we build. Skip One builds kitchens and puts in wells at orphanages and schools um, so kids can have, you skip a lunch and you get to feed a child, they get a lunch. And Omega now graduated college and has a job there. So I got to surprise her in January and God gave me this full circle moment with her. Um, and I, mm. I know that what we put into others is the only thing we can take with us. And so I feel like the stories and movies you're making are putting something into other people that they will leave changed because mm -hmm. you're such a talented storyteller. It's just amazing. Mm -hmm. You were in, um, thank you, first of all, you were 
in one moment I remember you telling me about that I would love for you to just share as we close today. Um, you went to go visit a family, a, a generations of women. It was like a, a grandmother and a mom and a daughter and her baby, four, four generations in a small, I think it was a mud hut. Um, I just, if you could just, this is, yeah. this is like the wisdom every one of us needs to hear right now. Yeah. We were in Lima, Peru. My husband made that trip. My husband actually made that trip. We were showing up, we were building a kitchen, um, and a pastor of the church there who those are the heroes, right? We're not trying to Americanize these places. We want to let their natural environment thrive by loving our neighbors and going to the ends of the earth. But as this pastor, it was getting dark and I was with our team from America and he said, can I, you visit one more house? I have a very faithful woman who attends our church. She serves at our church. There's four generations that live there. And I said, sure, as we get there, this door, half hung door, it was a, a, a tarp for a roof. Um, this, this woman was in this, I'll never forget it, a light pale blue dress. She looked like she was backlit from Touched by an Angel, the movie, you know, the show Touched by an Angel. She opens the door. She had a pot you would cook an egg on turned upside down with a candle for light because it was getting dusk. She invites us in. Cleanest dirt floors, Karen, I've ever seen. I mean, just took pride in her home. She cleaned her dirt floors. She, as I walk in to step inside of this little home, I look for a place to kind of let the guys in. And I almost sit on her mom who could fit like in a baby car seat. She was in her late nineties. She's on this one little couch that they had. And I stand, she goes, oh, that's my mother. And I'm sitting there with, and she has her, her candle out walks her daughter, who is probably my daughter's age with her baby, baby granddaughter on her hip. And I start to cry, which every pastor on every mission trip tells you not to do. So then I feel uncomfortable. They go, please don't cry when you show up at these people's homes. So I start to cry. I get uncomfortable. So I pretend like it's tears of joy because inside I'm thinking, what hope do these women have? Oh my gosh, there's four, four women here. They can't even, can't even don't have electricity. They have no running water. As I walk to her and say, because I'm crying, I go, may I pray for you? She looks me straight in the face. She goes, I'd actually like to pray for you. And being an Italian, I go, why? She looks me, not even offended by what I said. She goes, because you have way more things to distract you from our God than I do. And as she put her hand on my shoulder, mm. my knees hit that cleaned earth floor as if God was pressing me there. This woman prayed a prayer over me to this day. Nobody has ever prayed over me, that God would open my eyes, that I would get the blinders off, that I would fix my eyes on things to come and not on earthly things. She prayed over me a prayer that completely shifted the atmosphere in my life. And um, it's so important that we realize that it's like, I'm not worried anyone watching this or read that reads your books or goes to this movie is going to fail at anything. We are the 1% that live in America. My fear is you're going to succeed at something that doesn't matter. Right. Mm, beautiful. Well, Shalene, I want to thank you, you know, to me, and I, I really wanted to just read Proverbs 31 over you. You know, I'm just going to, I had it here. I'm just going to, some of the things here. She opens her arms to the poor. She extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household. All of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for the, for the bed. She's clothed in linen and purple. But here's the part, too. I mean, just all of this is you. It reminds me of you, every word of it. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. So, I mean, laughter being so important, but it goes on. You know, she speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. There you are speaking all over the world, faithful instruction on your tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. And that is you. That's you. It's your kids. It's, you know, Brookie and, and Blake and just there and, and Grace. And just like, it's an amazing picture that you are that Proverbs 31 woman. I think in our personal relationship, we've kind of 
covered it all. Like we go deep when we talk, but that laughter keeps coming up again and again. And, you know, if you're listening to this and you're wondering, how am I ever going to get out of this hard season that I'm in? First of all, I want you to think about that prayer that that woman prayed over Shalene. Like we are so distracted here in the United States or wherever you're listening from. I mean, if you have the ability to listen to this, you're probably distracted. We all are. Get your eyes on Jesus. And don't take t life too seriously. Like part of writing a bestseller with the days of your life is laughter. So laugh about it. You're going to laugh about it later. You might as well laugh about it now. It'll be good for your liver, good for your heart, and good for your friendships, good for your family. Uh, Shalene and I can attest to that. So Shalene, thank you so much for being on the show today. It's been incredible. Next week we're going to have your good friends, your, your family really, uh, Taylor Lautner and his wife Taylor who goes by Tay, and we're going to talk about their Lemons Foundation. So that's next week. Thank you so much for being here on the podcast. And uh, if we can close, I would like for, if you don't mind, I would love for you to pray yes. as we close. Yes. Oh, God, thank you so much. Just thank you, God. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the gifts and talents you've given Karen. Thank you that she doesn't bury them, God. I pray for everyone listening and watching this podcast. Father, that you would spring up something new in them, that they would look up today and notice your goodness all around them. You are a good, good Father. God, we just want to make heaven crowded. Father, we ask for a miracle. We ask that you do something more than we could hope, ask, or imagine, and that you would be glorified through it, that people would see through us to you in everything we do, in the way what we say, with how we love people, with how we speak to ourselves, how we love ourselves well under your, under your guidance, God. You are, it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. All of this is fading away, but you remain. We love you, God. Thank you for the cross, and thank you for the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen.